Okay, we're uh, talking with uh, Judge Faye Chess, who is running for re-election as municipal court judge. Um, feel free to uh, give us an introduction. You have two minutes. Hi, so as you know, I'm Judge Faye Chess. I am currently a judge in Seattle Municipal Court in position number six. I've been in that position since 2018, having been appointed by the city of Seattle's mayor. I brought to this job and I continue to bring to this job a lifetime of being a public servant. I started off my career as a public defender here in the greater Seattle area. After leaving there, I worked for Seattle Housing Authority, Seattle School District, um, Group Health, Swedish, Providence, and um, then let's see, where did I go? Oh. I went to Seattle Municipal Court. So I have worked in every area that impacts people on a daily basis. When um, individuals come in front of me, if they talk about being in Section 8 housing, public housing, if they talk about the um, issues with getting um, health care, if they talk about what their life was like through education or what their educational skills are, I know something about it. I used to say, I was master of none. I think I'm a master of a lot. So um, been a lot of places and seen a lot of things. One of my biggest strengths is I bring empathy, understanding and resilience to this position. I was a single mom. I've been laid off. My daughter's been laid off. My former husband has been laid off. I understand the issues that face you when you lose a paycheck and you're the one heading the household. Um, I survived a fire. Um, when I started for this position, I actually lost my home to fire and I was living in transitional housing while I campaigned for this job. So I am very resilient. What I'm hoping for is that people believe I bring something of value to the court and that they will help me retain the seat. And that's just a little bit about me. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to start with the prepared questions. And again, you have two minutes to answer each one of these questions. Um, Alice, you wanna take the first one? Sure. What are the elements of your background and experience that make you best qualified to earn our endorsement? Well, um, I talked a little bit about that. Um, as you all can see, I'm African-American. As I indicated earlier, um, I have experience being a single mom. I've again, lost housing. Um, I've worked on behalf of individuals. I've worked on behalf of organizations. I've sat at both tables. A lot of times when you meet judges, they have had one path. It's typically they were a public defender, they came to the bench, or they were a prosecutor, they came to a bench, or they went to a law firm. What's different about me is I actually sat at the table helping to provide legal counsel or HR support to folks who made the policies. I actually got to sit in the room and challenge people on their lenses. What are, are they culturally competent? Do they understand equity? And because of the positions I've held, there are many people in the room that would sometimes call me out and say, we expect you to be our voice for you to talk to those up high about what the real issues are in that are challenging us. And I've done that in public housing arena, the public ed education arena, arena, healthcare, and then being an advocate as a public defender. I bring a unique skills, a set of skills to this table. I'm also a member of the Minority and Justice Commission. I'm also a member of the, I'm a governor appointed member of OCLA, the Oversight Committee for Legal Aids. So not only do I care about criminal justice, I also cr care about what's happening in legal aid on the civil side. So I think with my uniqueness that you wanna judge who has this many lenses and can understand and can hear and can empathize for those who come in front of her and also make the tough decisions. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Clayton, do you wanna take the second question? Sure. In what ways can the courts better serve those of moderate or low financial means in civil actions? Okay, although um, Seattle Municipal Court only handles criminal cases, I was a pro tem judge in King County District Court, so I handled civil matters. 
Also, I was an employment labor attorney for about 20 years doing civil matters. So I can speak on it in a more realistic manner than just kind of academic. One of the things that is a burden is the lack of understanding about the criminal justice system or the legal system, period. A lot of people, when they get a divorce, first they say, I don't have the money to afford an attorney to represent me in this action. If they are facing eviction, they go, where do I get somebody who does landlord tenant, even if they know how to ask, ask, it, ask for it? So I think is our system becomes better and better when we become more inclusive, meaning we put in measures that when anybody comes to the door, they can understand what their rights are, what's accessible to them, and to get them, and that's part of OCLA, is to make sure people get civil representation, particularly in cases where they can't afford an attorney in an eviction matter, in a family law matter, and things like that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, question number three, Barbara, do you wanna take that one? Yes, thank you. Um, if, you pro if providing over a criminal docket, what role do you think judges should take and what would you take, if any, in diverting defendants to diversion programs such as the drug court, the mental health court, and other diversion programs or other alternatives to incarceration? Okay, so I'm not sure how many people know at Seattle Municipal Court, we have specialty courts. We have the community court, we have mental health, we have the veterans court, we have domestic violence court. So these are three courts that when people need a specific focus on their issues. So let's say they're accused of domestic violence, we have now called the DVI program. So as a judge on the arraignment calendar, like I did that today, then I may set a case in DV court so that person can maybe get the support of the DVI program. Sometimes I have individuals in front of me who are veterans and a lot of issues have come up as a result of their service to this country. So I will divert them to DV, I mean, to the veterans court. We've had the community court now for a couple of years. That's another avenue where you see people doing low level misdemeanors who are struggling with substance abuse, ha housing. Again, they're diverted into the community um, court. Now I know publicly there's been a lot of discussions because the city attorney of Seattle has decided that the high frequency user, high utilizers are not appropriate for community court. So if those individuals don't go into our community court, does not mean that we as the judges don't have another opportunity to align them with services to address some of their needs. They won't, go, they just won't go through that program. So we spend a lot of time in our court as well as myself. Also, I'm gonna personally tell you, I've directed, I've gone and Googled. When somebody is in front of me, I've given them information about career fairs for people who have um, backgrounds, criminal backgrounds. I have told them about different, because I've worked in the community, I've, I've got resources and I point them to them. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Laura, do you wanna take question number four? What is your position on bail reform? What factors do you or would you consider when deciding whether to impose bail? And what changes would you advocate for, if any, if elected? Well, um, today, as I indicated, I sat on the jail calendar. And if those who don't know what the jail calendar means is this is the first time individuals who have been arrested comes before a judge. So all day to day, I made the decision whether bail should be set or someone should be released on their personal recognizance. Our goal is to impose the least restrictive uh, means to ensure community safety. So we look at three factors. One, do they have a failure to appear history? Two, will they be a violent crime risk? And three, whether they will comply with court orders or interfere with the administration of justice. So this is something I do all day. Um, there may be some people who might disagree with my decisions, but I do that analysis every single time. One of the things that you look at is, will this person stay out of, a tr out of trouble? And that is forecasting. And you don't just look at somebody's history because as you all know, 
my people of color have long time been put into a system where they have generated a lot of failures to appear. So you can't just look at that. You really honestly have to look at the whole person, the entirety of their situation. Again, because of places I've been and places I've worked, I have a broader understanding. So if somebody comes in, me to, in front of me and I know they've just gotten a job, if they stay in for two or three days, they're gonna lose their job because they're a probationary employee. So I give people opportunities to stay out of jail I don't want to keep them in jail. And as I tell people, especially young people, when I sentence them, I don't expect to see you ever again in this system. I'm hoping that at the misdemeanor level, this will be their only entry into the system and they will exit to the left. So I believe in bail reform. I believe looking at the least restrictive. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to move to questions from the e-board. And again, with these, you have a minute to answer those. Um, someone want to start off? Yeah, Laura. I'd love to hear uh, what your experience has been like on the municipal court um, during COVID and switching to um, virtual court at times and whether you think there were benefits or uh, detriments for uh, folks access to the justice system. So benefits has been that a lot of people who struggle to take time off of work, to find daycare, to make arrangements to get to court have been able to get to court. That's been a benefit. Also, um, a lot more accessibility to be able to um, speak to their attorneys. But the downside, I mean, there's been a lot of good things, but I think what people, what saddens me is, Sometimes people aren't able to see my face. That's because they don't have the technology to get on the screen and see the actual court hearing, the participants. Um, and so I really lament the fact that I make decisions on people's lives and they actually have never seen my face. But when someone tells you come back, when you have your video, you can have video on, I'm like, no, we'll just still go through with it because this has taken time and we need to expedite their process through the system and not delay because their life has not allowed them to have the right, right technology. So that's kind of pros and cons, but I could go on for days about it, but I, it's here to stay. Appreciate that. Uh, Alice, you have your hand up. Yeah, I was gonna ask what um, sort of rotation or type of case you uh, most like working on um, in your in your work? Um, I'm a general trial judge. And so that means is that I do arraignments, pre-trial hearings, reviews, sentencing, trials. I've been doing that now for six years. When I was in King County District Court, I was a pro, pro tem judge there for 20 years. So there, my favorite was anti-harassment orders and small claims. I'm a people person. So I love hearing people tell me about them, telling me their stories. So actually, I like what I do every day. I get to talk to people. I get to ask them, tell me why you are here. Tell me what your traumas were. What led you here? And we really get to engage. And people tell, one attorney said one time, just just do your mm -hmm. mother thing. And I sit down. I said, let's talk. You know? What's your plans? What are you going to do after you get out of here? What is it that we can help you with so you won't come back into this system? So pretty much I like this gig and I like everything that comes with it. I, as I tell people, this is my jam. I get to bring everything I've learned over the almost 30 years of living in this city and working in this city as a public servant to my, to my job every day. Great. Thank you. Uh, Clayton and then Pat. Um, I keep thinking about Yesler housing. I think a lot about housing. Um, Yesler Terrace, uh-huh. Yeah, Yesler Terrace, built by the city. Mm -hmm. And I think about um, Seattle Housing Authority a lot, which um, seems to be um, a kind of outer Mongolia of city bureaucracy. 
Uh, and I think about people who don't have housing, and I think about the waiting list to get into public housing. You've actually worked there. Can you tell us something about your experience in working at Seattle Housing Authority? Okay, so I, I worked- to those things. Yeah, I can tell you, I worked there when Clinton, President Clinton was in office and he made some drastic changes to public housing. He did the three strikes you're out, meaning that if you had violations that were pretty high, violations of the list, meaning let's say you had a family member who was doing drugs and you didn't keep them away from your home, let's say the grandmother who let her grandchild, the drug dealer, stay because he had no place to stay, under Clinton, it was the three strikes you were out. Just like three strikes you're out in the federal system, harsh, right? It's almost like accomplice liability. So here we are putting out people who are trying to keep a roof over their heads as well as their loved ones, and they have to make a choice between their loved ones or themselves. 10 seconds. And I was also there when um, the garden communities like the Yester Terrace started becoming multi-income facilities. Really quick is we lost a lot of low income housing with that. That was the reality. We did, we lost it. And I don't think this city has ever replaced it. Thank you. We got time for one more question. Um, and uh, Pat, did you did you have a question? Did we? Yeah, leave? I'm sorry, I put my hand yeah. down. Um, okay. uh, uh, just, just can you just uh, I have a high level question of why do you think it's important that we have um, an elected judiciary as opposed to um, uh, say an appointed judiciary? Well, we do have appointments because I was appointed, sure. Sure. but then I have to keep my job, right? Mm -hmm. I think that there says there's something about do you want it bad enough? Are you going to keep working for the people? <sighs> Do you understand who you work for? I tell people, I said, you know, this is the first gig I've had where I don't have a boss, but I do have a boss. I don't have one individual that I report to. I report to the citizens of Seattle. They're my bo boss. And if they don't think I'm being a good servant, then they can make the decision to let me go. And I think that keeps a different perspective of someone who is appointed for a lifetime to a position and never gets challenged on their thoughts and ideas and their fidelity to the law. So, yeah, just thank a few you. thoughts. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. And again, we, we hate to cut you off, you know, trying to, we're trying to keep it to time, but um, well, well said. Um, we got time for a one minute uh, closing statement if you'd like to make one. Well, I think I tried to stick a lot in, in a short period of time about me. I'm very transparent. Again, I lead with my experience with, I think I'm culturally competent. I think that's critical for people who sit in this position. Um, I think it's critical that when people come in front of you, you should not expect them to show up like you or live the life you did, um, that you hear them, you hear their story, you understand their trauma and you understand the lack of, of services and the services that are available. And that you create a sentence, a judgment that speaks to them and not the world, because that's who's in front of you. Okay, well, Judge Chess, thank you so much for, for coming into our virtual space and uh, chatting with us. I very much appreciate that. Um, we can... Uh,